I want to first of all say Happy New Year. We spent our Christmas vacation this year in Anchorage, Alaska with family and it was the third time we've been there. The first time was in the summer and the second two were in the dead of winter and it was bitter cold. It was it ranged from about minus 12 degrees up to about 5 degrees Fahrenheit and lots of snow. I hate snow and I was raised in the south and I only like snow if it has the word cone or globe after it. But anyway, I spent a great deal of time in this field, this empty field adjacent to the house where we were staying, just standing there in this, this blanket, this muffled blanket of nothingness. Uh, later in the afternoon, which is my favorite time of day, around 3.30 when the sun sets there, uh, when the value of the sky and the ground are almost identical and you can barely make out where the sky meets the earth and you can barely see the, the undulating profile of the mountaintops all framed by these black stark trees and I would stand there for 30 or 45 minutes at a pop in complete silence and aloneness uh, I could see my breath, I could feel the ice pellets hitting my shoulder uh, I could hear my heartbeat I think and it really, I think, reinvested my commitment to the notion of blankness. And I've talked about this before. Blankness, I feel, is, is one of the highest aspirations for a painting, to achieve a level of blankness. And I don't mean in, in that there's no content or no imagery. I mean that, 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 that the painting achieves a state where it becomes a template or a proscenium into which the viewer can project his or her vitality. I know that a painting is not working when it feels opaque, when it feels like there's a wet blanket hanging over the surface and it's trying to do too much, there's too many little fussy parts. The painting becomes finished when that blanket drops and when the painting becomes transparent and that's how I know when there's that state of blankness. Um, when, when anything is possible for the viewer and, and the artist through the terms of the painting in that moment. And it also, I think, rekindled my, my love of, uh, of containment. And I think that's what, what every work of art, in a sense, does, is it offers a sense of containment. That I can be out having this external experience with sensations and thoughts uh, ranging from, from jubilation to melancholy and back again. But there's that internal burning need to contain it, to force it and compress it and condense it into an object that, that is, is the summation of a marriage between rigorous personal conviction and obsession and uh, the, the, the physicalness of an object, uh, the tangible nature of an object with all the attendant limitations that you might associate with a painting, with the tradition of painting, um, with the limitations of oil paint and a flat surface on a stretcher. I love those limitations. And and I think, in a sense, my job is to, is to intensify and to condense and compress that experience into these artificial terms and, and to know when to stand the hell out of the way so that that experience can, can hit your nervous system at 100 miles an hour. Uh, that's, that's what I strive to do. Alaska was beautiful, and to segue from some of those snow images, I want to look at this painting by Augustus Vincent Tack, who lived from 1870 to 1949. A very interesting early American modernist painter. And I've also always been jealous of his name. I would love to have that name. I would also love to be named Abbott Thayer. But anyway, in this Tack painting, you can see bold, concise, decisive, design elements. That wedge shape formed in the foreground by the fallen tree with the tuft of snow, then the grouping of trees on the left side, the distant hills on the right side, and then the canopy of sky overhead. All bold elements but fused together in, in a beautiful rotation. This is from around 1930. This is also a tack painting, but you can see the firm foothold of the process of abstraction, of reduction down to just very simplified pictorial elements, and certainly through the lens of Japanese printmaking. But here, it, it reminds me of, of one of the quotes of one of my old teachers who said that, an eye not told what to see sees more. And in this, there's a beautiful modulation of color from the pale purples and blues, magentas at the bottom, up into the green yellows in the middle, and then that beautiful pudding color at the top. 
Here's another tack painting, and you can certainly see uh, the foreshadowing of Milton Avery. And in this one, he knows to go simple and bold in the top because he's giving you a lot of information in, on the bottom. And I've used this analogy before, but if you think of a water balloon, if you squeeze one end of it, the other end bulges out. So think of the bottom part with the squiggles as the squeezing, then the top yellow part as the bulging. There's a compression and expansion. Then there's that beautiful, perfect brick of pale blue uh, toward the, the lower right-hand side. I think of squeezing water balloons every time I'm painting. <laughs> uh, here's another tack painting. This one in an arch format, probably for a commission. And it brings to mind the notion of compositional climax, of using large, generous elements at the periphery and then gradually winding your way into smaller subsidiary shapes with higher contrast and often a uh, higher key hue toward the center of the painting. Here's a painting of mine from 2004. And I'm trying to keep the, the, the motif very clear and very bold in that large kidney bean shape in the background, which is that very dark umber and black color, which references the rivers of South Carolina where I come from. But I want a very bold motif to draw the viewer in from 20 feet away, and then when you get in, you can examine the, the more detailed elements formed by the lattice grid work of the cerulean and ultramarine blue, the, the smaller pictures inside of pictures. But the whole burrito is held together by that, that brown lasso shape on the bottom. Um, and then, of course, I think it's nice to look at an 1830 print by Hokusai. And, and this one I carry around in my wallet with me. I, I think it's an astounding example of, of pictorial acumen. The composition is so right, I can feel it in my bone marrow, practically. And I love the color at the top, that pale, fleshy, doe skin color, and the way it plays off that very handsome dark blue inside the waves. This is image making at its very best. And what I'm trying to say in all of these examples is, is cut on your windshield wipers from time to time and, and try to see bold, simple, clear shapes. I'm going to combine in a new painting some manganese violet with some permanent green and I'm going to add some pure linseed oil because I like a slimy consistency to the paint. And pulling these two together creates a beautiful third color. It's a dull brownish purple color, somewhat reminiscent of olives. I'm half Albanian, and my grandfather on my mother's side was 100% Albanian. And in his garage, he used to have Tupperware bowls full of olives. And I remember loving the color ranges of those. And here, it, it, the marriage of these two colors together creates just a, a really beautiful, dull color. And I'm using it in this painting. My next New York show is in October of 2014, but I'm already started on it. And it's interesting, everything I see and do manifests itself in the paintings eventually. And certainly some of those Alaskan experiences, I think, are already coming to fruition in these very icy, bone-numbing colors of this painting. listening to Count Basie records and he has that great quote, if it sounds good, it is good. And I've always applied that to painting. If it looks good, it is good. And I know some may think this is an oversimplification of the possibility or the role of a painting, but I've been doing this for 30 years and, and the older I get, the clearer things become. And I believe that if it looks good, it is good. I get kind of sad sometimes when people come up to me at openings or, or lectures or wherever and say, I don't know anything about art, but I like this and this, and I can't explain to you why I like it. There's no explanation necessary, and there's no need to know a thing about art. All you need are two eyeballs. And, and that, that is important to me. It reminds me um, every now and then that my role is, is to, to what Delacroix calls create a feast for the eyes. Uh, I am a visual person. My, my allegiance is to the eyes. Uh, we are visual artists. And that's why I think it's so important as you're painting to get distance from the painting as you're working it, to back up. Um, for every few minutes you spend applying paint, spend double that standing away from the painting. Um, and if you don't have a lot of space in your studio, take a picture of it on an iPhone or a Blackberry, shrink it down and look at it that way. In the old days, I lived in a very tiny studio apartment where I painted and I had no room and I would take little Polaroids of, of paintings, shrink them and then ride the subways back and forth just looking at them and making changes that way. It's so important 
to, to, to have clear, bold, concise, visual information in a painting. To grab, to be able to grab the viewer from 20 feet away by the earlobes and pull them into the, the image to examine it further. Um, it, it's so important sometimes, I, I, like driving in a rainstorm, to cut on the windshield wipers and see bold, clear shapes. Uh, unfortunately, the art world these days, and for a long time now, has been controlled by writers, by people who write about art, people who don't make it but write about it. And I think this is where it's important to, to divorce the art world from the practice of making paintings. In the practice, we are in charge. We decide the future, uh, the artists. And our allegiance is to the eyes first. Um, I went to graduate school here in New York City in the late 80s. and there was an awful lot of very, very smart painting being done on the floor. And uh, um, paintings that would require pages and pages of theory and explanation and usually a nap after uh, just to look at them. I remember a guy a few studios down who spent months um, deliberating whether or not to glue a penny onto a piece of canvas. Um, he ended up uh, doing that and uh, thank goodness for, for Western art. Um, our job is a visual one first, and then all of the other things can fall into place. Um, paint first, shut up and paint, as my teacher used to say. Do first and then think second. Mm -hmm.